I'm going to tell you a little bit about the office and some of the projects we've been doing. And um, I think as many of the presenters here, it's uh, a little of an ambitious uh, slide deck that I've taken along. So it might be that we skip a few or that some of it is a little bit faster. Uh, so, but thank you for the invitation to come. Uh, we're currently working together with the CIS uh, team here on campus, looking at the campus landscape and doing a public realm strategy uh, for the campus, which is a great exercise. Uh, it, very interesting, wonderful campus you've got. And so we're looking at, uh, we're looking forward to continue the collaboration uh, and uh, we'll maybe come back later on next year to talk about the outcomes. Um, but back to the beginning, so who are we? My name is Henriette Vanberg and I'm from Gill Architects in Copenhagen. Um, Gill was started by Jan Gill um, and Jan was educated as an architect in the 1960s. Came out as a good uh, modernist architect um, doing whatever architects were doing at the time. Uh, Rearranging a little bit from the top uh, and um, looking at whatever the outcomes were. Also a period of uh, time where there was a lot of uh, renewal of cities, of, uh, of trying to uh, provide housing very fast um, in a more or less successful way. Um, and so um, life was good, uh, but then Jan met Ingrid. Uh, who was a psychologist. Uh, then trouble started. Uh, sh uh, she asked, why are you architects not interested in people? Uh, and uh, a whole new uh, life career started uh, for Jan, looking into the relationship between people and space and people and buildings and the whole um, understanding of uh, the environments that we create and what they do to us and how they either build communities or don't build communities, how they're great places to stay or not so great places to stay. Uh, and got him more critical around, these are volunteer, uh, volunteers for the photo, I should say. So you've got uh, probably well-known people here, but they are volunteers. So uh, this kind of rearranging the city from the top where we look at these all oh, these wonderful shapes that we're doing, and then we, plunk them into a context, and perhaps it works or it doesn't work, we don't always know so well. So, um, yeah, so this is making, I'm an architect, so I'm supposed to do this as well. But uh, this is kind of looking into this, ah, oh, maybe we do some round stuff, maybe we do some squares, maybe something more upright, I love the green, maybe we twist them a little bit, perfect. A brilliant new housing estate, uh, they're going to love it. Uh, so, but this kind of whole understanding of what happens at ground level, uh, so what's the environment that we create, how is it to cross the road, what kind of traffic does it generate, that whole understanding. Um, there was a tendency to losing that uh, at the time when Jan really started his career. And sometimes we lose it still today. So for Jan, he started uh, looking at, uh, as part of an academic career, to look at life and form and how the two influence each other. Um, and, um, and that took him 40 years uh, to figure it out and to talk about it and, and, um, and understand it better. And he started out writing books, so did uh, Life Between Buildings, uh, that some of you might have read. Uh, looked at um, studying how we walk very slowly, five kilometers per hour, and how we understand space. So what's the human scale, and how can we relate it to what we build? How we use all of our senses in moving around in the city, but how the visual sense is the most important, and how we, uh, we have this 72-degree angle of observation. We rarely put our necks back and look up at how the wonderful skyscraper meets the sky, but we look more at the ground plane and at the ground floors, and that's really how the interaction between us and the buildings, that's the ground floor. Um, yep, five kilometer per hour architecture, kind of the traditional cities around um, lots of detailing, uh, curvy streets, lots of experiences as we go along so that we are invited to walk more. 
and then the higher speed environments where there's less happening, less detail, the scale is bigger, uh, it's more vehicular space and we get tired of walking, stop walking, get in the car and drive. Something around scale, also this is from Singapore, uh, from the waterfront, a um, very popular little stretch of uh, buildings uh, from the turn of the last century, um, wonderfully scaled and divided and built on the same recipe. Then um, reality uh, checked in, um, and so this is not Photoshop, just to let you know. Uh, this is reality, so, so it's our interest to understand what happened from that scale to the other scale. So how did we lose the detailing? How do, we don't need to build historical buildings still, but how do we remember the relation with the human scale and the detailing also in the new stuff so that we actually relate to the space? Looking at um, so something that we're working a lot with in the office is trying to look at first at life. So how can, how can we plan for the life that uh, we can expect in a certain area, if there's new housing development, for instance? So what's the life? How many people will live here? Where they're working? Uh, where they're uh, getting transport? What are the places uh, that they can stay in? So what's the life we can expect? Then what are the places that can underpin or offer space for the life, and then what are the buildings that create those spaces. And in a number of new developments, we see it happening the other way around. First we do the buildings, then a little bit of space in between, and then perhaps life happens or it doesn't. Uh, but it's very hard to, to come out and fix it afterwards, uh, where more care into kind of understanding what it is, what type of community do we want to build, and then what's the environment that can create it? Part of the office and part of Jan's research has also been around uh, collecting numbers, data, information about how people use cities. So how many pedestrians and what streets, uh, what time of the day, what's the age and gender, how many people are spending time, what are they doing? This is something we did in August here on campus, collecting a lot of information about campus life. So what people are doing, what are students doing, staff doing, visitors doing, um, to understand how the space is performing. This has been collected uh, in the number of reports for Copenhagen every 10th year. This kind of status check on how the city is performing, um, what is going on, and that has been quite a, a practical tool also for politicians and the city administration to actually know what's going on in the city. Uh, it's not guesswork, we actually know what's going on and, uh, and we can see whether it's growing or it's the same level or it's uh, dropping down. So how can, we, um, how can we evaluate the investments or the improvements we're making in terms of whether they're good for public life or whether they're actually killing it off? Um, this uh, way of collect, this is what we're calling the Stone Age method. Um, that's the click, 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 uh, one clicker per student. Um, and of course, there are various other tools we can use today, but uh, this is the pedagogical method that was also used here on, uh, on giving students a little clicker, putting them out in different locations, and actually standing for a day with breaks uh, and looking at how many people pass here. Uh, part of that exercise has also been that you actually look at the city, you understand what's going on, and you appreciate and learn more about the life that takes place. And this is something we've, uh, we've used in workshops and projects uh, all over the world. Yeah, so this is the book I mentioned before, uh, Life Between Buildings, uh, in, not in the English version, but, oh yeah, a little one. But uh, so I think what's been surprising to Yang maybe is that the book has been translated into numerous languages, um, and that um, and that it uh, with the new book, the Cities for People that KRU came out in 2010. Uh, the same thing happened. Uh, it's translated into 35, 40 languages all around the world. So Bangladesh, Vietnam. US, uh, Argentina, Australia, you know, it's coming out everywhere and there's this uh, interest in 
maybe getting back to the roots and the logics of, of things and how to understand how uh, we can try to make it better and what actually are the components of cities for people. This has also led to the Gill airline industry. Uh, <laughs> we're not too proud of our carbon footprint. Uh, so a lot of uh, lines down to Australia and New Zealand, uh, specifically between November and February, that's a preferred <laughs> destination. And so, uh, yeah, so quite a lot of work in Australia uh, for the last 15 years, which has been a great pleasure. Um, but uh, now back to my hometown. Uh, so telling you a little bit about Copenhagen uh, and where I come from um, and how some of the learnings of Copenhagen is what we are also using in our work and translating into other contexts. So Copenhagen has changed for a long time. It's been working with things for the last 50 years of, uh, of very much looking at changing the mobility patterns of inviting people to walk and bicycle uh, as part of your everyday life. So how can that be a natural mode of transport and how can we offer the best possible conditions uh, to do that in the city? Uh, because part of Copenhagen's history is also that it's a medieval city center, uh, and the areas around it have quite narrow streets. So you could fill it with traffic and cars for a period of time, and then that was the end of it. So I think Copenhagen was challenged much uh, sooner than others. Uh, but we had all this. We had the car invasion uh, with parking in the squares. Um, and then this whole movement started around uh, pedestrianizing uh, the first street in Copenhagen in 62, which was quite early. Um, of course, a lot of criticism and thinking that it would kill off uh, business and retail in the city center, and it would never work. Um, but this is, is really something that has developed over the years. And what's maybe most interesting is that it's not, today it's not as much a system of pedestrian streets, uh, but it's a mix of pedestrian priority streets, uh, better balanced streets, some pedestrian streets, some other streets, shared space. So uh, some different uh, types of uh, streets that all form a network um, that can help to, um, to put more of the city center into play and not just the area around the key pedestrian street or the mall, as you would say in Australia. So this is the key uh, pedestrian street. Um, and again, that, that has been quite successful, and it has almost uh, 90,000 people during the day. Uh, when we were looking at George Street in Sydney, it had um, 32,000, uh, which was quite low, and you're 4.3 million, and we 1.3. So much more international visitors here uh, than we've got. So there was this discrepancy uh, between uh, how it uh, worked out, but that's a different story. Well, 1962, all 18 squares were parking lots, uh, wonderful, but that has gradually turned. Um, and the important uh, process here was that it was step by step, so it didn't happen overnight, and it wasn't this big push or move or a, a brand vision that came out that everyone got horrified by, but it just happened incrementally, uh, bit by bit, uh, and people learned to change their culture, learned how to use it, um, Retailers learned how to help to activate it, where to put their shops, opening times could adjust, etc. So it's happened over a really long period of time. And also there was this uh, traffic engineer who um, had um, a strategy of taking out parking uh, by 2 to 3% every year. Very little. They will hardly notice. But he, uh, he did that for 30 years. And... Uh, it amalgamated to something uh, over time. So this is Newhound, very popular, especially for tourists. It used to be parking, and again, now it's for restaurants um, and for people enjoying outside. Uh, so we're bringing back those bits of Italy and other sunny places for the few months a year where we can enjoy it. Uh, Town Hall Square, very messy one, used to bicycle across here, uh, almost got killed every day. This has been upgraded as well. And today also, this street is gone now, so that's connecting Town Hall Square with the pedestrian street that runs here. 
So Compton operates, this one is disappearing. There's a new metro station being built underneath here. Um, this has 65,000 vehicles, 60,000 people crossing here. Interesting when you think of city road and bridge and maybe tunnel and what do I know? So quite a lot of people passing here, quite a lot of vehicles. But plus the 65,000 vehicles, you add another 35,000 bikes. Quite a lot. Um, so a very busy street, um, right past Town Hall. So what's happened in the city is that people have responded in spending more time in the city. And this notion around public life is that it's both um, how many people come to the city, uh, but it's also about how much time they spend. So the more time that they spend, the more lively it feels, um, and that has, uh, so that has changed. So people are staying longer, and longer. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we see all age groups. Uh, so a common question in Copenhagen is whether we have a baby boom. And, and, uh, our population <laughs> is shrinking and we're producing too few kids. But this notion around having children in the city, I think, is alien to other cities. So they really notice, uh, coming to Copenhagen, that you've got all these prams and little kids running around, and that it's a city that's gradually be, uh, has changed to offer better conditions for families to stay in the city. And now we see that uh, a third of the outdoor activities in the evening and during the night. And this is sort of what is also happening in Sydney now, where I came here 20 years ago as an intern and lived in Wynyard in Erskine Street uh, in a little uh, terrace house. Uh, that was before the West Pack came <laughs> at the back. So, uh, so <clears throat> and it was so quiet. Uh, the evenings and the weekends, with nothing going on. But that's changing now, uh, the same as all over the world, that we're asking for more activity, we're asking to spend time in the city, and here where you've got the climate, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so all of this was recorded and used. Uh, families stay in the city. So what happened in Copenhagen was that it almost went bankrupt in the 80s. Uh, nothing was built. It was mainly students and elderly uh, pensioners who lived there. Um, and uh, what then started to happen was that the city eased uh, the abilities to put small apartments together to provide for bigger apartments um, and also started these upgrades of making it better conditions for bicycling, uh, better conditions for families with courtyards as part of their residential um, uh, living and also uh, better public squares, etc. So it felt like a more livable city where you could actually stay after your studies, have your kids and stay after the kids left. So that's the pattern we've seen that that families then stay. And uh, since we are a very heavily tax-based country, that's good for the economy, uh, because they pay more tax, um, so the city is coping much better. Yeah, so that, with that comes diversity. There's a metropolis for people is the policy that was adopted in 2015 by the council um, that's looking at setting goals for public life and for how, what's the distance we should have to green environments, how, how, what's the percentage of people who should be satisfied with their ability to enjoy public life. Um, so it's starting to set standards for it and starting also to, um, to use it as a driver for getting even more positive changes and to hold on to that livability of the street, of the city. Uh, what had to change in Copenhagen was this um, kind of traditional planning tradition of having someone taking care of the buildings, someone taking care of the footpaths, someone taking care of the trees, someone taking care of the traffic, others after the bikes, others after the pedestrians, la 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 la. So a lot of people who individually did their stuff and what they had to do, and what had to change was that it was thought of much more holistically on how all these elements come together <coughs> and how they form the streetscape. Um, in a holistic way. So how the city is developing now is also looking at a more context-based improvement projects. So whenever public space or street needs to be upgraded, it's, it's thought of in the bigger context of how it 
influencing other bits and how it's supplementing what we already got instead of duplicating uh, what we already have. So what happened was also that people outside the city center was then asking for um, some of the great stuff that was in the city center. How can we get it out to our, at our own doorstep? Um, we've got a harbor, now it's clean enough so you can swim in it. Uh, you just put, shouldn't put your little fingers into the mud at the bottom, but apart from that, it's okay. Um, and this is the only place in the city where it's perfectly okay to walk around in your underwear, which I think is amazing. Uh, you're in the middle of the city, and this feels natural, uh, and you're together with your fellow citizens, and you're enjoying it. Um, this is also an area that's quite uh, diverse in uses, and it has the, one of the highest uh, uses in the city. So yeah, more festivals, events have uh, come as part of the city, being more livable and interesting. There's a new pedestrian strategy of Copenhagen that was done a couple of years ago. The first one uh, that Copenhagen ever did. So Copenhagen came quite late in acknowledging that we've got a, quite a lot of people who are walking. And we got quite a lot of, this is one of the few Danish classes in this presentation. Um, so this is saying from good to world class. And uh, this is a shift because in, in Denmark, it's not allowed to brag about stuff that's not so good. So, uh, but now the city is starting to recognize, hmm, this is actually pretty good. We've got 40% commuting to uh, work or studies on their bike. That's actually something if we compare with other, other cities um, around the globe. So what's special for Copenhagen is that it's a city-wide network of bicycle lanes and that it's inviting the grandmother, the kid, and the mother with the kid on the back. Uh, no helmets, uh, it's a good thing to do, but uh, it's volunteer, uh, voluntary based. So, loads of bicycle lanes and tracks that are helped to, uh, that are continuous and it feels like a safe uh, network. And as mentioned, it, the bicycle commute takes quite a big part of the modal splits. So that's people moving to and from the city center, 41% on bikes, 30% on public transport, 24% in cars, <clears throat> and the last is walking slash running. I think that's very few. But uh, yeah, so that's quite good. And, um, and whatever problems we've got with the bikes, bike parking, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we just have to think about if we had to replace these guys with a car per person, that would uh, completely destroy the city and would take up a lot of space. So bicycling has doubled in the last 10 years, uh, and it has, during the last 10 years, it's really started to have some of all these extra um, additions to it, that there's a green wave for bicycles. So if you keep to a certain speed, you'll get green lights all the time, favorizing your commute. And yep, 70% uh, continue to bicycle in the winter. Uh, so we go to a lot of other cities where they say, ah, nah, you don't, ah, bicycling is not for us. It's too windy, it's a little bit hilly. Sometimes it rains, you know, and, and we think, yeah, but you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> If we can do it, so can you. Um, so it's growing, uh, and there's major complaint, serious congestion on bicycle tracks, so they've been doubled in size, uh, uh, of adding extra lane width to the bicycles uh, to get them in and out. And there's a new goal also looking at how to increase bicycling to 50%, um, integrating with public transport that's expanded, so double the size of characters that can carry bikes so you can connect with it. Um, this is the old government. Our new government is not so good. But the old one um, came to the Queen to be commissioned and arrived on bicycles, of course, uh, as you would. So um, we've got the Crown Prince with his 50% his Aussie kit. Uh, in the cargo bike, uh, bicycling as well. So there's not this thing around that it's uh, low status uh, to go bicycling, it's for everyone. Um, and also, I think interestingly enough, that we bike, I bike in this clothes, so it's not a problem. Uh, I don't wear Lycra or any special <laughs> gear. 
I ride in my normal clothes. I never sweat uh, because I ride very slowly. And I think that's probably what the majority does. Um, so why do we bicycle in Copenhagen? The depressing answer is that only 1% says it's because it's environmentally friendly. Uh, but 56% say that it's because it's quick, easy, convenient. Uh, so it's very easy and you know exactly when you leave home, you know exactly when you're going to arrive. You don't end up in congestion. Uh, you don't have to wait for a bus that's not coming. Um, so you know exactly what, uh, how long time it takes all the time. Yeah. Then uh, Copenhagen has also started um, looking at the numbers and the, the business case for it, and looked at how um, how it actually in the advantage of shifting transport from cars to bicycling is 60 cents per kilometers, and that deals with uh, cheaper infrastructure, um, and it's. Um, yeah, so it's much cheaper per kilometer to the, the bicycle lanes. And also, uh, when we look at uh, if we just do or pedal half an hour every day, uh, we have a 30% lower mortality or we live seven more years. And so that's great for us, but it's also great for the city and the country <coughs> because we pay a lot of tax in our country. So the longer we live, the more healthy we are, the more tax we pay. So it's good for society. And we cut the health costs. So when we look at the total health effect of us going less to hospital, having less sick days, living longer, la, 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 all that, uh, it actually amalgamates to quite a lot, uh, 330 million euro per year uh, that's saved uh, because we have all these guys up on their bikes. Um, so I think that convinced everyone that, um, that uh, bicycling is good for you and it's good for the city. And it's not an investment, but it's actually just part of making a more livable city. Then I've got some different examples. Uh, one from New York. So that's, uh, we had a visit from New York in 2008 uh, where they came to Copenhagen to study how Copenhagen was doing on the bicycling, wanting to learn how they could translate that into a New York context. That was when uh, Mayor Bloomberg had two years uh, left until re-election, um, potential re-election, and a number of uh, problems or challenges in New York um, around New York growing, uh, having a hard time fitting them all into public transport, uh, also acknowledging that 50% of all car trips in Manhattan were less than one kilometer. Uh, that's something you can walk in 10 minutes. Um, so a number of issues around the public realm and how it was felt that New York City was really underperforming. So what we looked at as part of the um, um, Plan YC that New York did in 2008, um, they were, it instrumented or pointed out th that uh, bicycle commuting had to be doubled uh, in five years' time. That's very ambitious, even when you are in the 0.5% end of the scale, just to get up to 1% per percent is hard. Um, so, um, yeah, but that was uh, what was looked at. And lo and behold, they did 200 miles of bicycle lanes in three years. It took Copenhagen 40 years to do the same amount. Uh, but this is the US. Just roll it out uh, very fast uh, to build that connected network. And what was looked at was then what does it actually mean? Well, for Ninth Avenue, it meant that crashes of all kinds went down with 56% and bicycle volumes up by 50%. So more bikes through the street, but also less accidents. Um, this is the model that was used. Um, that's called the uh, Copenhagen model, I think, where you've got the, the sidewalks, you've got the bicycle lane, you've got the parking, and the vehicle lanes. Um, here it's used to, so here you can kind of say that the parking protects the bicycles, instead of as it's sometimes done, where you put, you reverse the two, and the bicycles protect the parked cars. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so what was seen was also that there were more bicycles out there, but that the number of uh, casualties went down. So although we had many more out in the streets, uh, less accidents. 
As part of the project uh, in New York on the bicycle, uh, bicycling, there were also pilot projects. So there were upgrades to Broadway, um, and that was looking at um, also providing extra public space for people to use. Um, and it was looking at how to take traffic out as a through route through Broadway. And the interesting bit was that it couldn't be used, it couldn't be done as a permanent project, as it would take two years of traffic modeling, blah, 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 all kinds of stuff, engagement, all kinds of things, uh, looking into everything, can we do it? Uh, but if you call it a pilot project or a test, you, we can do it tomorrow. Uh, the only limitation was that uh, it should be done with in-house kind of contractors or staff, uh, and what do you have in the traffic department? Well, you've got the paint guys uh, who draw, pull lines out everywhere. So the paint guys were put into action to do a little bit of an extra paint. And the business improvement districts provided umbrellas, furniture, plants uh, as part of these things uh, in the streets. So it was looking at the Broadway Boulevard uh, and looking at the squares along it and trying to get uh, trying to clip the vehicle movement as a through route from A to B, uh, but allowing vehicles to come in, access a section, but then having to drive out again, access another section, but then having to drive out. Um, that took out uh, very complicated crossings that used to be there, and it allowed more space for, for the squares and along Broadway. So this is Herald Square uh, before and after, and I think everyone was worried about um, what this would look like or whether it would be completely barren and deserted, uh, but the traffic commissioner said that it was like Star Trek. People just popped out of nowhere, and it, it seemed like there was this need or crave for more places to stay and stop walking, sit down, speak with someone, meet someone, uh, enjoy the weather, uh, instead of constantly being on the go. So, another part of Herald Square, and this is Union Square, no, Madison Square, uh, of widening the traffic islands, uh, offering more space, putting out again some furniture. This was the first uh, run that the city did, and the day after, the local shop, uh, the Marimekko shop came by and said, we think it's much better if we use our umbrellas because they're much nicer. <laughs> Good, that's fine. So they took care of it, even put tablecloth on and looked after the space. Um, this is Times Square, hardly a square, this is how it was. Um, and this is when Broadway was taken out and new space was offered for the many thousands of people who, uh, 140,000 people come through here every day. And what was looked at was, in the old version, it, we did uh, all the counts around how many people passed through here and what is the traffic volumes. And if you look at the split, you could see the 90% of all users uh, were on foot and 10% in cars. Uh, and if you look at the distribution of space, you had 90% vehicle space, 10% for pedestrians. So the math was wrong. And I think that was, a very, uh, that was a very clear message to everyone that something needed to be done in terms of adjusting the balance. Yeah. So the benefits of that is that it's a place more accessible for all uh, and that it's a place where you can interact and meet, uh, where the locals use it more and also where you can do your yoga classes. <clears throat> yeah. So um, in 2010, there was the green light uh, for midterm evaluation report that looked at, so what do people think? This was a test or pilot project but we have promised that we would go out and ask everyone what they think of the test and whether we should go back to how it was or keep it as it is and do a permanent design response to the square. Um, so an overwhelming 74% voted in favor of keeping the changes, great, uh, just with the permanent design that has now uh, been installed, this is not it. Um, and also looking at what did it achieve well, it achieved improved travel time for vehicle traffic on the avenues because it took out complicated crossings along Broadway. 
It had more pedestrians, uh, not a lot, but there were already quite a lot. It had reduction in traffic accidents, less pedestrians in the roadway, increased stationary activities in Times Square, and an interesting point uh, around a raise in property value in Times Square compared to New York that dropped uh, in the same period of time. Oh, sorry, that was all of Broadway. So these improvements actually also threw off benefits for the properties along and for the retail along the strip. Yep, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. So that was uh, the quote of uh, Bloomberg, and he measured everything. So uh, there's quite good documents around meshing the street that collects all the information about how they used, what it meant for businesses, what it meant for real estate, um, what it meant for recreation, for uh, community needs. Um, and he got re-elected, Paula Bloomtown, uh, for the second term. I think he even invented a third term. Uh, and, but it's now out, of course. Um, so quite successful. This is traveling to the other part of the world uh, with a little less um, challenge of democracy. Uh, so we did some work in Moscow in 2012 uh, and um, for the mayor and it took me, for the first trip, it took me six hours to get from the airport to the city center. Oh, where you sat in huge queues, uh, waiting and waiting and waiting with other <coughs> people patiently waiting because they were so used to it. So this is a city that was completely flooded in cars uh, and where that had been the key answer to mass transport, mass transit for ages. Um, yeah. Uh, Eight million in Moscow, so it's very hard to make that work. Um, so what happened, of course, is that then the effects start on pedestrians in terms of their space invaded by parking. Um, these are parts of the areas we were looking at. And when we look at, again at pedestrian volumes in different streets, so in main streets, uh, the main street in Moscow had 19,000 per day, uh, and our little Copenhagen, if we remember, had 88,000 per day. So quite low pedestrian numbers because people would tend to avoid the public spaces that were of quite challenging quality, uh, narrow footpaths interrupted constantly. Uh, whoops, what's happening with that photo? Uh, and also in winter, so narrow footpaths, and in winter when the icicles come down from the roof, it's even more narrow. Uh, so issues also, um, yeah, around getting across the street. So to increase capacity for cars, all pedestrian crossings had been tunneled underneath the roads. Um, so you had to get, every, get yourself and everything underneath down the steps, under the tunnel, up again on the other side. And that was a widespread problem, so the map shows everywhere that happens. And my colleague noted that if you were in a wheelchair, the only way to cross the street and get out of a certain area was to take a taxi to the other side of the street to get across. Um, yeah, pedestrian crossings, quite full of um, parking. Random walking, jaywalking across streets uh, because you got tired of the tunnels. Quite loud noise uh, levels in many of the streets and areas. Uh, very few places to rest. Um, few elderly and children in the street, which you can understand because it was too hard to navigate. Um, a lot of the street trees had been chopped down to make more car lanes. Uh, so felt very harsh. A lot of commercial, uh, commercial stuff being put up in terms of signs and oversized commercial bits uh, in some of the main, main streets. And still this kind of discrepancy between the historic heritage and the detail and careful detailing with some of the old buildings and then how the street environments uh, were of a completely different world. Uh, Town Hall Square, again a parking lot. Uh, this is arriving to the Bolshoi Theater. So watch a, it's a very depressing story, uh, but it gets better. <clears throat> so this is walking on the Boulevard Ring, uh, a series of green parks uh, along it. And we found that 50% of the total walking time you were in the park, which was great. But another 50% you were trying to navigate this stuff to get from one end of the park to the other. Um, yeah, very popular 
benches, so too few benches, so you got to get very close to your fellow citizens uh, if you wanted to rest. Beautiful weather. Um, again, the promenade was pulled up to make room for parking. Um, and comparing um, the boardwalk or the, the available public space along the riverfronts in different cities, uh, Moscow was uh, quite uh, failing in that with a very low rate. So, key recommendation, trying to solve that car problem of having a flooded city centre and into a city centre that could do more. And big improvements were done on public transport to uh, install light rail, to install, there's now, there's a direct train line to the airport, um, do more metro, uh, introduce a taxi system that wasn't there before. Um, and just looking at a constant upgrade of streets, squares, and along the parks. Skipping some of this. Yeah, so the river park, we did a uh, suggestion for that. Uh, and then the whole report came together with all of the diagnosis, what's the problem and how can we try to solve it? That was displayed uh, in the main street, Tresgaya, uh, and discussed by the city architects and the politicians with people passing by and people could look at, so what is it that we're suggesting that we should be doing? And then, uh, kind of what we've learned is that the Russian way is that then you just do it. <laughs> and so we were very surprised. We've been working in London where you talk about it for a long time. But uh, in Moscow, okay, this is what these guys say. They, they've been uh, appointed by the mayor. So this is what we're doing. Uh, so they started rolling it out. Uh, the mayor called uh, Jan uh, a couple of months before he was coming to present the report and said, okay, so what's, going, what's, what's in the report? What should we be doing? And then Jan said, well, I think that your main street with the parking, that's not so good. So maybe the parking should go and we should have a little bit more greenery. And when he arrived two months later, yeah, cleaned it, it's gone, parking's gone. Uh, New benches along it and greenery and cleaned up the commercial bit so you can see Kremlin in the background. Um, and if you forget that you shouldn't park there, there's an easy solution for that. So he had four vehicles going up and down to um, remove them, drive them somewhere else. Town Hall Square, not the most interesting space they've created, but they've started reconquering the space, trying to keep vehicles out and then hopefully coming back to uh, create something interesting. More smaller pedestrian streets, introducing uh, public bikes, which was not part of our suggestions, as we still think it's a little bit dangerous. Um, this, is the, um, this is the riverfront before. Now I think I've got a problem because it's a PDF. Yeah, I got a problem. So at the back, if we could remove that gray photo, there would be a wonderful waterfront at the back. Uh, and that was again done uh, within three years uh, of just cleaning it out and uh, offering a better waterfront. This is, a, this is an interview with the mayor, Subyanin, who was appointed by Putin to clean up Moscow. Um, and so he started doing that. Um, the former mayor had a little bit of a problem with his wife having a road construction company and a little bit too much money <laughs> sliding that way. So, uh, so this is the new mayor uh, who was uh, appointed to clean it up and to try to get Moscow further up on the livability index. They're a bit unhappy about being 33. So, um, so he tried to do that, uh, but I think what's interesting is also that his viewpoints is around a livable city. So it's not just about a nice city, but it's also about how it's more livable, how people actually can enjoy uh, spending time and living in Moscow. And this is part of this whole uh, change that we're seeing of moving from city of industry to city of knowledge. Uh, so in the old days, uh, all of us would move where work was, so where the factories or the workplaces were, and that was where we were going. Today is different. We are more uh, picky. Uh, we like a good place to live, preferably a good climate. Some of us are uh, ready to compromise on that. But uh, we, we need a place where we can see ourselves with our families and where we can have a good life. So we go to the cities where we think we can have that, and then the industries and workplaces need to follow. So the 
the whole competition around livability is really important and is what is um, the competing factor between cities today. Uh, now moving into uh, a different story on Brazil. So uh, if uh, Moscow was low on democracy, well, then you can't do anything in Brazil without engagement. It's all about talking, 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 engaging. What do you think? Uh, how can we do this better? So in Sao Paulo, uh, there were a number of issues around, again, again quite a um, deserted city center. It didn't feel very friendly at night. Um, and they had all kinds of different problems. So part of it uh, was that we um, helped them with doing a series of workshops um, in the city that was looking at some of the key public spaces and what the quality was. Uh, these are resembling the happy or not so happy smileys are resembling different quality criteria, looking at uh, how it is to walk, how it is to recreate in a certain space, what it looks like, uh, how it is to listen, or can you interact with someone? Um, so it's not just about the sign, it's about a lot of other different parameters uh, that can help to talk about the quality of a specific space. Um, again, collecting information about how the spaces were used um, to be able to compare with the interventions later on. Um, and then four pilot project sites were chosen in the city centre that we work with together with the municipality. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the two. So this is the Lago, I can't say Paisando, uh, before. So that was um, a roundabout, uh, an important uh, transport node for people uh, getting the bus. There was a church in the middle. Very, um, yeah, pure, poor waiting situation. So not a lot of benches, not a lot to do. So we basically just caught out on the island waiting for your bus. Uh, and and the whole thing wasn't supported by um, activation. And it was actually also hard to get there. So after, perhaps hard to see the difference, it was upgraded uh, with more coloring, even the sun started shining. Um, and, but what happened was that more play facilities were installed in the square, so something for the kids to do while you were waiting for the bus. Also some of these flower beds that were worn out just adding benches on the side and a little playground in them. Um, offering this deck of activity where you could come and do things, where things could happen at night, uh, used for events. Um, and what we found was that uh, the use increasing, so people spending time in the space, not just the amount of people coming, but also the amount of people spending time there grew by 34% but also the diversity of activities grew. So it, it was not longer just standing or sitting, waiting, but it was actually also using the place for different purposes. Um, again, a lot of interviews uh, with people there that uh, really approved of the project. Again, it was a pilot uh, testing things out. Uh, and when asked about what were the most liked or loved elements. It was the deck chairs and umbrellas, very simple uh, things. And when it was asked what the events that they specifically liked, it was the public readings um, of just coming, listening to someone else reading a book. Yep, even the church started upgrading or repainting uh, their building after the intervention to, to upgrade. The other um, pilot project was another one, Largo Sao Francisco, that was uh, sort of close by. It had, um, this is it before, it had all these blue fences that were around some exhaust pipes to the underground car park. Uh, not a very friendly place, but it was actually um, connecting two different parts of the city, um, two important parts of the city. But it wasn't understood as a plaza, but more as somewhere where you just passed through. It was considered unsafe, although a lot of people actually had to move there. Uh, quite a number of students in the area, uh, very close by. So again, simple measures, pedestrian crossing. Uh, just to get some indication that a lot of pedestrians are cr actually crossing here, helped a lot. Uh, the other intervention looked at how to deal with the exhaust pipes and remove the fences and create a deck. 
uh, that could actually be used for recreation and that started to create a space or a place for people to use. Yeah, so this was it before and after with the deck um, coming. And again, widely used. Uh, no need to uh, do extra efforts in terms of inviting people, but it popped out of nowhere again. Uh, offering free Wi-Fi, a place to sit, some, some shade, uh, activities happening during the day, um, event calendar, but also this public outreach, asking people what do you think of it, and collecting information about how it was used, uh, by whom, uh, when, what were the age groups. Um, and again, the same 80% increase in people spending time, so many more people spending time there. And again, also a very diverse uh, activity range uh, happened in the place where it wasn't just about <laughs> standing or, or waiting, but it was about a lot of other things. Yeah. <clears throat> so the short story is that if you offer people deck chairs and umbrellas, that's it. That's kind of the... The key recipe to happy people is really uh, sometimes very simple. <clears throat> and maybe that's easy to understand when you see some of these photos. Um, what people liked the most uh, was uh, the outdoor cinema, which looks great. That's something you think that will be lovely to do with your fellow citizens, to sit in a square and watch a movie together. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Yep, this was the opening party. <clears throat> and the old users stayed. So um, creating a, a safer square by having more people there, there was no need to push them out. It was okay for them to be in there, just provided a better place to sleep on. <clears throat> people starting having their birthday parties in the square. Local artists started putting up small little installations in the square, or just acknowledging it as a place. Uh, instead of just a pass-through pass area. It's got its own hashtag. Uh, it's called the Praia Urbana, so that's a beach uh, in Portuguese. So now it's the beach of Sao Paulo, which are hundreds of kilometers away from the ocean, uh, but they've created their own beach. This is the mayor visiting. Um, and the joke is that now he's got his, he's got his playa, he's got his beach uh, in the middle of of Sao Paulo, uh, which is a wonderful achievement. Yep. So to end with, there's so much more to walking than just walking. Uh, I think I've got around 100 slides still, but I think we probably <laughs> need to end. Um, so maybe this is just talking about how when we do these pilots, it's really important that we study the place before to be able to know uh, what has really happened when we started the after. That's also possible then to say, okay, what could we, we refine or do better in a permanent solution? Um, part of the work here with, um, on campus is also looking at, at probably doing some of these pilots uh, next year, uh, if we're a little bit successful. So, um, yeah. So tip of the iceberg, the pilot project, um, very visible. Uh, but the learnings from elsewhere is that there's a lot of work uh, behind the scenes in terms of actually getting it out there and in terms of ensuring that it's got a long-term strategic goal and it's not just flavor of the month, but it's really about changing the city to something better. That's it for me. Um, thank you. And I'm aware that I'm a little bit over time, but if you have questions, I'm happy to respond. What are you doing this week? Yeah, so in Sydney, we, um, we did a, um, uh, we were part of the Sydney 2030. Uh, in 2007, where we did a, a public space and public life study on the city centre. And since then, we've been working with the city of Sydney in terms of implementing that. So that has been helping them uh, doing a lot of advocacy for the change. We've been 
called the Scandinavian icebreaker or the door hammer. So that's someone who's coming in from the outside and who can maybe sometimes open doors that are hard to access if you're here locally. So the George Street project is something that came out of the work we did in 2007. So that's something of, we, of course, looking very much forward to see how that will turn out. Um, and then we are uh, commissioned by Sydney University to look at the public realm strategy for the university. Yeah, so those are the two key ones. Hi, um, just had a quick question. I wanted to know roughly on average how long the study or analysis phase takes of the different cities that you mentioned, like what's the average? Yeah, um, I don't think there is an average. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that in some cities, uh, in some cities it, it follows a very kind of nice neat pattern of doing maybe a couple of months of research and understanding the city and then moving into strategies and recommendations and then there are the other processes where it's everything kind of happens at the same time because of current projects where it's important that we need to know what to say so it goes a bit back and forth so and i think that that's a natural process of of this field and of urban design that we um, we do an analysis and we look at the recommendations and then we pull it back and rethink our analysis and you know so it goes back and forth um, It seems one of the um, biggest um, blockages is with the uh, traffic engineer and the sort of the, you know, RMS or whatever, to transform things. I guess sort of wondering what the sort of main change was. Is it, did it start with politicians or was there any uh, sort of enlightenment in that sort of traffic body to sort of really just transform the approach? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I don't like to point fingers, uh, but I think some, uh, I think there's this... It's also a historic kind of trend where um, the traffic department has been tasked with making this thing work. And so that's what they're doing. So their shop is about getting, keeping the city moving, avoiding uh, gridlocks or congestion, and about having, you know, constantly moving traffic. So that's what they're tasked with. So there's also uh, a need of a political will to retask them to kind of say that, well, we are actually rebalancing things here. We need to invest more in public transport. Uh, we need to make better uh, conditions for walking and bicycling as part of, of a, a growing city or as part of improving our city. So I think it also comes back to that kind of political will to, to actually redefine what it is that they, what it is that they are delivering. Uh, and that kind of thinking, if we don't like what's coming out of that end, maybe we need to go back and look at the machinery that's generating. Uh, so there's something around the policies also. Yeah. Other questions? Hi. It's kind of a question about um, the positive nature of the change. And thinking about Moscow, and you said that they just kind of implemented it, and then Sao Paulo was a lot of consultation. Mm. Do you find that the difference of the governance structures really affect the outcome in terms of how people are using them and, and their acceptance of the change? Um, yeah, I think definitely there's a, there's a tendency to us working a lot in places where the governance structures are difficult. <laughs> uh, so we worked a lot in Australia. So, uh, you know, there, there, there's this... Um, it can be overlapping power structure, uh, like with your state government and your municipalities, that uh, or the local government, um, and that there. I think often people's needs and wishes and wants are the same. So it's very that feels quite global. That what we're asking for, it's very simple as with the uh, deck chairs and umbrellas. Uh, we just want a place to sit in a nice city, yeah? you know, and we're not so specific about what it should be. Uh, necessarily, uh, but I think that there is this thing around governance that's really important uh, and around how that can actually deliver the right outcomes and that's a bit back to the machinery. So if that machinery keeps on 
producing what we don't like, well, then maybe we need to go back and actually fix it so it starts producing the right stuff. And that, that's been the process in Copenhagen uh, around the municipality completely changing their setup and the way they work together in terms of being able to produce that and move from being a regulator to a facilitator. So actually someone who's happy for someone to come with ideas and facilitate that that can happen. Uh, I'm wondering about autonomous vehicles, you know, robotic cars, and uh, there's a lot of talk about those at the moment. They can self, you know, in the best predictions or the most optimistic predictions, they are much safer, they can operate closer together, they can self-organise according to demand and all of that. But have you done any modelling on that? Because you can, you can visualise a city where the road spaces that we've got at the moment are actually too much and you can actually pull back from that and a whole lot of space becomes available. Mm. Yeah, so I know that the city of Melbourne did a study on, on um, self-driven vehicles and um, I think it's, it's a complex question because I think it still replaces, it's, it's still a car. So it's still, as a person, you take up quite a lot of space. And I think that in Moscow, it would have solved the problem of people uh, getting bored in their cars because you could sit and work. So it wouldn't matter so much if you spent six hours to get somewhere because you could use that time for something. So I think there's still a challenge in terms of having the vehicles on the streets. And I know that from City of Melbourne, they talked about how it could be an issue in generating more traffic because you wouldn't have to park it. You could just let it drive around the block for ages. Um, so, so I think that it's, I think it needs to be investigated what it can do. And I think definitely maybe on the capacity that it can increase that. But I think also we still need to remember that it's a, it's a privately owned vehicle and that that comes with extra spatial requirements compared so to... Yeah, no, that would be good. Yeah, because definitely I think it, uh, private cars that's part of the equation, you know. So it's not like it's driving them out, but they're part of the equation. So everything we can do to improve that is good. I just don't think it's going to solve the problem. Yeah. Anyone else, or have I exhausted you all? Uh, um, you quoted also, it's a very it's a banal question, but you quoted also reports like, that, like from New York and stuff like that. And you had that slide you had with, about all the the accidents and stuff, are those available? Yeah, they're on the web. So um, DOT, Department of Transportation New York, has got a lot of that stuff. And if you Google measuring the street or green light Manhattan, you will get all of it. Um, and I think we've got a good friend down here who's also filming um, this thing on the YouTube channel on the university. So that's another option to go in and get these links out if you forgot what the name was and whatever. Yeah. Over here. About the project you made in Brazil, I was um, curious about how you addressed or the city addressed the problem of criminality, because I, heard, I lived in Brazil and a lot of, of lot of professionals saying that it won't be a good idea to put to put pedestrian streets because of the criminality problem. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's a, a common thing. I think it's I think it's a real Sometimes it's a real issue that we try to solve criminality or unsafety by driving everyone out of it, uh, and that it keeps being even more deserted. Um, and some of the discussions we've had here at campus has also been around, um, you've got a campus bus driving around picking up students, and. Um, and part of that can also be because all the recreation and all the little small bars and eating places and things that all students and staff go to is not part of the key movement corridors. So there's something around how that we should put everything together so that it benefits each other and, and add to those key movement corridors activity and activation that can help you feel safer. So it becomes a normal environment uh, that is overlooked by others. Uh, there's the passive surveillance. 
uh, instead of being this deserted, uh, isolated place uh, where you don't want to come or where you wait for the college bus to pick you up or whatever. Um, so I think there is this kind of trying to normalize places with normal people that can help to, to balance it out. What is your view of uh, uh, George Street Project? How is it going? It's, uh, now you're coming back to see what's happening. Yeah. What you were hoping to, to happen with the yeah. happens that oh, I was, yeah. the, the, the street is in a terrible state in London and there's a lot of traffic and a lot of people in chaos. Mm. What you were expecting to happen, how do you see it? No, what I've heard is that it's no, I don't live here, but that it's been managed well. Uh, and um, But then I think there's, with me, a little bit of a frustration that there's this gap between local government and state government, so that no one really knows what they're doing. And I think that's a real issue, that, uh, that, that that's not um, shared uh, in a better way, or there's not this cross-collaboration that's seamless and where we work together. Um, so there's a lot of this parallel work where local government does its thing, state government does its thing on exactly the same place. So it's kind of doubling everything up uh, that I don't think is helpful. But I'm looking very much forward to see your street further down the line. Yeah.